to start uh, a live course and it will be given by Andre Walker from the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, United States. So Andre got his PhD degree from the University of Washington in Seattle in 2006 and he uh, went to be a postdoc at Maryland, uh, William and Mary, and then LBL in California. Again, as a faculty member uh, just a few months ago, uh, he's done a lot of interesting work on applied arts QCD, uh, so probably uh, physics. And so today he will introduce his uh, research activities to us at Google Home. Okay, thank you. So, can you all hear me? Yeah? No? Speak up? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. I can hear myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, I have some paper slides. So, first question is how low well can I write? I'm going to guess it's something like right here. Can you yeah. see higher? <laughs> okay, so it's a very small window to write. <laughs> okay. So, yes, so uh, in 240 minutes, I get to introduce the entirety of lattice field theory, lattice QCD, and talk about the Ethan matrix model. So, there's going to be a challenge. So what I've done is try to pick a few aspects of lattice QCD just to help give a flavor for what do you actually do to perform the calculations, why would you want to consider performing the calculations, why we have to perform the calculations, and then how you know, do you actually understand any physics out of these things. Uh, and then in the end, I'll try to connect it to matrix elements. So for example, this morning we heard about uh, structure, so that involves matrix elements of the nucleon, which is like the magnetic current. And also another hot topic you'll hear later about today is searches, correct searches for dark matter. And so you can compute matrix elements in the nucleon you need to know if dark matter interacts with the standard model. So, so this is, I would say, it's a very interesting time uh, to performing physics research. As you all know, uh, two years ago, the Higgs boson was discovered at the LHC. And the accumulation of information about the Higgs has told us it's pretty much the standard model Higgs. There's very little room that could potentially be something else. So it looks like it's a scalar as opposed to a single scalar, spin zero, and just everything we need for the standard model. And there's zero hint so far from the LHC of any physics beyond the standard model. At least it's published. Uh, and then you look at all the other experiments, and there's only two experiments that show any tension within the standard model. One of them compares experiment to experiment, the proton size puzzle. And the other one is the muon anomalous magnetic moment. And otherwise, there is no direct evidence for any physics beyond the standard model. But you look out into the universe and you observe the stars and the galaxies. We have very strong reasons to believe, based on observation, that there has to be tremendous amounts of physics beyond the standard model. Right? So we know if you look at the stars uh, and you study the early universe through what's known as the Big Bang nucleosynthesis, this is the production of light nuclear elements that come out of the Big Bang, that the matter in the universe described by the standard model amounts to only 4% of the energy budget that is necessary flat universe. And we know observation of the universe is flat, meaning it's going to expand almost forever. And in fact, we know very recently it's not quite flat, it's very slightly accelerating. And then there's other evidence that there has to be this dark matter, right? There is, uh, you look at the rotational speed of galaxies, and the rate that the stars are spinning in the galaxies exceeds what it could 
if it was only held together with the visible matter or the matter from the standard model. And in fact, we know, and then you can do um, n-body simulations to study the, the growth of galaxies through the expansion of the universe. And those n-body simulations plus these rotational curves of galaxies favor roughly 25% of the mass of the universe is dark matter. So you might say, well, what about modified gravity? Can it just be some change in the laws of gravity at long distance? Well, then there's this observation of the bullet cluster. Are you guys familiar with the bullet cluster? So the bullet cluster is this observation of two galaxies that have gone colliding through each other. And they can see the matter got stuck. But then they can look at the gravitational lensing of stars behind this bullet cluster and see that most of the mass just went right through. It didn't interact at all. And so that tells you there's this dark matter stuff that just passes right through without interacting much. And that's causing this big gravitational lensing. And that's very difficult to explain with modified gravity. So again, it looks like 25% of the mass of the universe is made out of dark matter. We don't know anything about it other than it's non-relativistic, and it's weakly interacting, both with itself and with the standard model. So as far as we can tell, it only interacts gravitationally. So how do you know it's self-weakly interacting? Because we know dark matter exists in big halos, whereas the galaxies collapse down on the spiral galaxies. Right? So the interactions of stuff with stuff in the standard model causes it all to collapse from this ball of disk to this flat pancake. Whereas dark matter stays in this ball. So we know it's very weakly interacting, which is why the most popular model for dark matter is weakly interacting massive particles, WIMPs. So we hope dark matter interacts with matter, because otherwise we have no way to detect it on Earth. But there's tremendous experimental effort all over the world to look for direct detection of dark matter. That means you need to know how to solve the standard model. You need to know how that would interact with matter. Okay, what else? And then the rest of the universe, so that only gets us to about 30% of the energy budget required to keep the universe flat. So otherwise, the universe would have just blown away, right? Because there's not enough stuff. So you need this extra dark energy to make the energy budget of the universe come out to be flat. And there's just a slight excess, so it's just accelerating. It's slightly, in some units, slightly, slightly, slightly greater than one. And so what does that mean? That means almost everything out there, we have no idea what it is, so it's really exciting. And there's almost zero experimental hints of what to do. So what can we do? So the LHC has found nothing. So all the searches for very high energy physics has resulted in confirming the standard model. So the two hints are muonic, uh, G minus 2, and this proton size radius. Uh, what's another big hint? We know uh, in the early universe that there uh, was roughly 1 billion photons for every proton or neutron. Right? So that's some measure of the asymmetry between matter and antimatter. Right? So all matter, in the, the standard model of Lagrangian, is almost perfectly symmetric between matter and antimatter. So as time evolves, the matter and the antimatter will annihilate and turn into photons. And so the early universe, there's this parameter eta, which is the uh, ratio of the number of n per new, OK, I should write bigger. Uh, so I'm going to be challenged to write big and have no room to write. But bear with me. And please, you know, interrupt any time with questions. So eta, so this is the ratio of nucleons to photons in the early universe. And we know observationally that this is a number that's about one part in a billion. Now, that's a very small number, but it turns out, so what do you need? If you assume the universe begins in a matter-antimatter symmetric state, then the amount of, then you need CP violation, among other things, to generate matter-antimatter symmetry. 
and the amount of CP violation within the standard model is not nearly enough to generate this ratio. It would be much smaller if it just came from the standard model. So there's another big hint. There must be some source of CP violation beyond the standard model. If you have CP violation, you will have permanent electric dipole moments within standard model particles. So if you assume this beyond the standard model physics is from some high energy scale, you can integrate out that high energy physics and treat it as local effective operators in the, in the standard model. Then they will give rise to permanent electric dipole moments for the electron and the quarks, which means there will be an electric dipole moment in the neutron, for example. So you know there's another huge search for neutron electric dipole moments. And that's related to trying to understand the observed asymmetry between matter and antimatter in the universe. So these are kind of clues of where to look. And one of the lessons that comes out of all of this, again, because LHC has not found anything besides the Higgs, where are you going to find this new physics? So people are cranking up the intensity. It's called the intensity frontier. We have lots of neutrino experiments. And the other place to look is precision, low energy nuclear physics. So if you can very precisely compute things in matter, then you can constrain the standard model. But what does that mean? That means you have to be able to solve the standard model, which means you have to be able to solve QCD. And as you all know, QCD is non-perturbative in the infrared, so there's no way to solve QCD in pen and paper, which gets you to lattice QCD. So that's what I'm here today. Okay. Yeah. So this is, say, at three minutes after the Big Bang or so, something like that. So this is the, the cosmic microwave background has been measured, and they have an asymmetry there, and they can evolve the evolution of the universe back from 300,000 or 400,000 years at the, uh, when the uh, freeze-out happens and the light starts radiating, and they can determine this grand photon ratio. Uh, it, should in, uh, it should decrease over time. So more and more matter, if there's any residual antimatter left, it will eventually find matter and annihilate. So at a certain time, this is like order one? Uh, I don't know if it's ever order one. In the very, very early universe, I mean, probably photons and positrons and electrons were created in thermodynamic, close to thermodynamic There's some chemical potential you could use to figure out that very soon. Okay. So, for example, things you want to know. You want to know how to compute, say you take a nucleon, here N stands for nucleon, in this case a proton or neutron. We need to know how to calculate First approximation, this is what we need to know. Quark matrix elements in the nucleon, where you know gamma is in the set. All the standard currents that you can construct with quark bilinears. So these matrix elements are needed. So gamma mu, this is the electromagnetic current. Right. This one we know pretty well, unless these quarks are strange quarks. Then all we know is it's very small, but we don't know the number. Uh, gamma mu, gamma phi, that's the axial current. So proton or uh, the axial charge of the neutron is measured at, from neutron beta decay, neutron to proton. That's related to this axial current. But then you need to know the pseudoscalar density, and you might want to know the tensor charge of the nucleon. These are all quantities you would like to know so that if the BSM physics, the beyond standard model physics, interacts with matter, it's going to do so with one of these currents. Again, so I'm starting from the paradigm, I'm assuming the BSM physics is heavy. What do I mean by heavy? I mean it exists at some scale, lambda BSM, which is much, much greater than, say, the mass of the Z. So then what you can do 
is you can integrate out this heavy field with standard uh, effective field theory techniques that Wilson taught us uh, and treat this BSM physics through local operators with standard model fields. <coughs> Yeah, you also have, sorry, yeah. You can put flavor changes in here as well. You just, the first thing you do is you, you start with the simplest assumption and see if you can determine something. But then that doesn't work, and then you say, okay, well, let me try adding flavor dependent BSM physics. Yeah, that's, that's true. And so the one, the one is what you want to know. So. Uh, pretty much the interactions, if, if dark matter interacts through the weak sector, the interaction with the W and Zs have basically been ruled out already by the experiments. And so the only remaining sector is through what people call the Higgs portal. So somehow, if this matter can mix with the Higgs, you know the Higgs can talk to quarks through the Yukawa coupling, and so it will mix with this one. So this is, but it will also be proportional to the quark mass. <coughs> and so this is the scalar quark condensate in the nucleon. So this is a very interesting quantity you want to know. This is one of the ones I'm going to talk about in the third lecture specifically. Uh, and this is something you can, all these matrix elements you can compute with lattice QCD. And there's no other good way to compute them. So, all right. So, we want to understand the standard model. Okay, uh, let me uh, take step, two steps back. One, I, mean, I said, I assume BSM physics is heavy so I can use this language of effective field theory to describe how stuff interacts with the standard model. Okay, mu on g minus two, so I'm just gonna contradict myself. The discrepancy uh, in the value of the mu on g minus two prediction from the standard model and the measurement the numerical size of that discrepancy is the same size as a one-loop standard model correction. Not to say it could come from some forgotten standard model thing, but just the numerical size is that big. There's no other quantity in the standard model that has enough wiggle room that you could add a correction of the size of a one-loop standard model correction. So that makes it sort of difficult to understand how, unless you very specifically add physics to the muon and not something else, how could this physics cause such a big correction and not screw something else up? So that's motivating people to look for light dark matter as well, which you cannot capture in this effective field theory framework in the same way. Uh, and the other thing, uh, now I forgot the other thing I was gonna say. That's okay, if I remember, great, if not, it wasn't that important. Okay, so we want to understand the standard model. We want to understand how beyond standard model physics might interact with the standard model. And so, like I said, that means we have to be able to solve QCD. But QCD, you can't solve in pen and paper except in the high energy regime. And so what that means is we need minus QCD. So this is short for lattice QCD. So I assume you're familiar with QCD. If I put an L on it, you'll remember, ah, lattice QCD. But if not, if I write it down and you don't know what I'm talking about, go ahead and ask. So what's, why lattice QCD, not some other model for QCD? Okay, point one, lattice QCD is not a model. That's the most important thing to take home from these lectures. Lattice QCD is the only non-perturbative regularization scheme we know of that is systematically improvable. That's the most important point. So lattice QCD, unlike any other attempt to solve QCD in the infrared regime, is systematically improvable. What does that mean? It means there are no systematics. The three big ones come from, you have a discretization scale. You have your entire box is in a finite volume. And 
often the calculations are performed with quark masses that are not equal to the physical quark masses. So you have to find some way to take the calculation and extrapolate to the physical quark mass. And this can mean both the light quark masses up, down, and strange if you can consider strange and light, and also charm and bottom. They're not at their physical value. In fact, you can't even put a dynamical bottom quark in a lot of calculations. But the point is, through the language of effective field theory, we know how to account for all of these systematics and to work at any desired level of precision and remove the correction needed. So this is the most important point. So with <coughs> effective field theory, which I will often denote EFT for short, you can parameterize these systematics and remove them so you can compare now I think I'm writing too low based on what you told me before compare to nature and so what this means is there's absolutely nothing you have left out of the calculation there's no approximations you made that you cannot control. And this is the only infrared, non-perturbative regularization method for QCD that can do that. That's the, that's the most important point. Okay, now that I just talked about how great QCD is, because it's the only lattice QCD, because it's the only thing you can use to solve QCD, it's very limited, okay? So you can't solve QCD in real time. You have to solve QCD in Euclidean time. And so that means you can't do anything dynamical. These are the drawbacks. So this is why is it great? So you have to work in Euclidean time. So what does that mean? What that means is what you want to do is use effective field theory to match onto the lattice QCD calculations. And the whole, you know, I could go on and on about effective field theory. Why is effective field theory great? It is also a unique way to describe the physics of QCD. The problem with effective field theory is it comes with lots of coefficients that you cannot know ahead of time. You either have to determine them from by comparing your analytic work to experimental results, or you can determine those coefficients by comparing directly with lattice QCD. The point there is, so you have this effective field theory expansion. Uh, wait, that's not a drawback though. So what are the other drawbacks? So no dynamics, so no scattering directly. If I had two more lectures, I'd tell you how to do scattering. But you, uh, okay. And so, also, if you're interested in like uh, the quark gluon plasma, you can't do out of equilibrium, out of equilibrium dynamics. You're stuck studying equilibrium QCD at finite temperature. So you can't do that. No scattering. Okay. So what do you do? Because lattice QCD is limited in this way, uh, and other things you can't do, you can't probe, so you can probe elastic nucleon scattering, and you can calculate matrix elements that you want to know for deep and elastic nucleon scattering, but you know, scattering experiments are performed over a whole range of Q squared, and there's a lot of what you call medium energy values of Q squared, where you just can't use lattice QCD very well because you need a hierarchy of scales. So if your lattice QCD is gonna make sense, your discretization scale, we often call it 
A for the lattice spacing. What you need is one over A has to be much, much greater than any QCD scale you're interested in. So the inverse discretization scale has to be so fine that you're not destroying the QCD dynamics. But then computing power limits you to a value of A on the order of, say, 2 to 3 GeV. And so you can't really probe very high energy scales into the medium energy range. And so what you need to do is perform lattice calculations where you can, use effective field theory, and even models, if that's what, the only way you have to describe some dynamics, match those onto the lattice QCD calculation, and then you can determine the unknown parameters in these theories directly from QCD. And so what you can do is you can imagine marching you know, your computing power up so that you can connect lots of nuclear physics with QCD. So you have to begin with your lattice QCD calculation. which, uh, when done properly, is synonymous with QCD. And for example, from here, you can compute, uh, let me not use this jargon just yet, you can compute quantities with chiral perturbation theory. You can determine the coefficients in this theory directly from QCD. And then with this parallel perturbation theory, you can calculate processes like dynamical things that you can't compute in the lattice, but you can directly compute them from QCD by matching parallel perturbation theory to lattice QCD results. So you can build up this way and start connecting to nuclear physics. And so you can do the same thing with baryon parallel perturbation theory. So now Chi PT is short for chiral perturbation theory. You can do the same thing with heavy quarks. So you can do heavy meson chiral perturbation theory. Compute properties of heavy meson with char or bottom quarks. You can directly compute two nucleon interactions, maybe three nucleon interactions. And these are all connected together. And so what you can see is there's a program where you can perform these lattice QCD calculations and systematically encode the information of QCD into these other theories, which you can use to then make predictions for the standard model. And these days, this is becoming a pretty exciting thing because the computing power has finally gotten to the point where you can do calculations at the physical time mass and actually make predictions, not postdictions. So meaning. Lattice has actually been used to predict a number before it was measured experimentally. And the experiment found that the lattice calculation was correct. So that's an exciting thing. That happened for the first time just a few years ago. Okay, so that's kind of my introduction. So what are we going to talk about? So first, brief review of QCD, because there's something you need to make sure you know about QCD before we talk about lattice QCD. And then we'll say brief introduction <coughs> to lattice QCD. And so, in order to talk about lattice QCD, we need to understand the, the ingredients of what we'll talk about uh, in these few days is two, what goes under the name, two-point and three-point correlation functions. So, Throughout this talk, I'm going to assume you're familiar with quantum field theory. Uh, if I say something that you've forgotten, 